Hallelujah. Uh, I would like I want to greet all of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, standing here is Pastor Samuel Manyama from Word of Faith Bible Church. Uh, today is the day of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made for us to rejoice and be glad in it. And indeed, um, I know by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will rejoice today. Because as you hear the word of God today, your spirit will receive it. May the attitude of your mind be as ready as your spirit as we minister the word. This period and this time, our focus is on Jesus. And as we're focusing on Jesus and on Jesus alone, uh, we have to remember that we are in a very different uh, period. And this period and in this day, today, the whole world should be celebrating. The whole world should indeed be celebrating uh, the Passover. The Passover, as it is a custom in Israel, after their departure from Egypt, from slavery, that Mudimu has ordained Passover as a prophetic uh, ritual that the people of Israel, the Jews, had performed. As we delve into the word, we'll understand today what this Passover mean, meant. Today is supposed to be a Good Friday. I do not know why they say it's a Good Friday, but it's a Good Friday. It's a Good Friday because today you're going to hear the word. For me, it's a Good Friday because today you're going to be liberated. There will be edification in your life. It's a Good Friday yes. because the word of God is going to enter your heart mm -hmm. and your spirit will receive it. So I want to bring clarity before I get into my message today doesn't really symbolize the crucifixion of Jesus. Today, Jesus is in the tomb. Jesus was buried. And we know that on Sunday, Jesus Christ will be risen. He will be risen. And according to the custom of the Jews, Jesus Christ, as we trace and as we research, Jesus Christ was crucified and he died on Wednesday night. As we celebrate, this should be, in actual fact, the second day when Jesus is in the tomb. So you must get this clarity and you must get this knowledge. Because as he resurrect on, on, on Sunday, that will be the third day, the, the full third day. Third day, three days, three nights in the tomb, Jesus spent. He has taught many times and even in the temple to say, you know, if you want to see a miracle, this temple can be destroyed and the third day it will rise again. And indeed, Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. And that was Sunday. And the Bible says in the early hours of Sunday morning, Morana Jesus rose up and he was resurrected. Therefore, it cannot be that he would have died on Friday. Indeed, he has died on, on Wednesday night. But if today I want us to delve into the scriptures as you get enlightenment as i get enlightenment and as you get enlightenment as you go to the book of exodus chapter 12 you will learn there of the passover and I'll, and you will see that this scripture is actually very prophetic so as we get into the into 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 exodus chapter 12 we're going to read there from verse 1 I'm going to put this mic down. So as we read uh, Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father a lamb for a household and if the household is too small for the lamb let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons according to each man's need you shall make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Let me stand there, stop there at verse 5. You know, 
we call Jesus the Lamb. And as we call Jesus the Lamb, many call him the Lamb of God. Now this understanding must come home today. That as this Lamb, the word Lamb, as Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior is called, it comes from the Exodus chapter 12. And as you see this, when God spoke to Moses to instruct the children of Israel to take the lamp without blemish, to take the lamp without blemish and sacrifice it. So this was also very prophetic. It was taking, talking into the future. It was talking into the coming of Jesus. It was referring to the lamp that we are talking about today, the lamp of God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of our salvation, the Lamb of our sacrifice. So today, as you see, let's quickly run to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29. And as you look at John 20, um, chapter 1, verse 29, you will see what John the Baptist had called Jesus. As he saw uh, Jesus appearing and teaching his disciples, John the Baptist also had his own disciples. And as he taught his disciples, upon the appearance of Jesus, he said to his own disciples, Behold the Lamb. Let's look at it. Now, John 1, verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, he also emphasized the purpose of why Jesus came. So the lamp of God that takes the sin of the world away. So that's the very purpose that the lamp came. And as you go back to the book of Exodus, you will learn that this lamp had its own significance. Why the children of Israel had to sacrifice the lamp. The lamp symbolized, you know, uh, preservation of mankind. So the people were saved. So when the plague hit Egypt, when people died in Egypt, when they died because their heart, their hearts were hardened, those who used the lamb, those who took the blood of the lamb, let's go back to the, to the book of Exodus. You will see when the when the when the when the families were fed by this lamb as it was instructed from the from verse 1 of the book of Exodus chapter 12, that this lamp was significant. There is something important about this lamp. Verse 6, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That's the lamp. You shall keep this lamp isolated until the 14th day of each month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, kill it at twilight. Let's wait there. So when you talk about the twilight, you talk about when the sun hit the horizon, either in the, in the sunset or when the sun comes up. So at this point, we're talking about sunset. So when there's a twilight. At the twilight, when the sun hit, when the sun hid, and you can only see its rays from the clouds, that's a twilight. And the Bible says here in the book of Exodus, that the lamp must be killed in twilight. As we quickly run into the book of John, we remember that when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified round about in the afternoon. He was, he was found to be dead. Because it, the, the Israelites at that time, they were preparing for their Passover. And at, Pass, at Passover, it was a holiday, their holy Sabbath. It was the preparation of the start of Sabbath on Thursday. So they didn't want anyone hanging on the cross at that time. As they moved, as they walked and they went to the people who were crucified there. Remember, Jesus Christ was crucified with two sinners. And they found that the two sinners were dead, were, were still alive. And the, Jesus Christ himself was already dead. So if the sinners were not dead, they were going, or if the sinners were still alive, they were going to be killed right there. If Jesus was still alive, they were going to crush his bones and he was going to die. But unfortunately for them, when they, found, they went there on twilight to ensure that these, these people are dead, when they went to Jesus, they found him dead. And as they found him dead, it meant two things. 
that they had to ensure that Jesus indeed is dead. And upon ensuring them, they had to pace his side. And his side was paced. And that was very scriptural as well. Because it was also a scripture fulfilled that was going to be pissed on his side. But his bones were not going to be touched. None of his bones were crushed. And the Bible teaches us that he was not going to be touched. And indeed, these uh, uh, Jewish soldiers, when they went there, they found him dead. They didn't kill him. They didn't crush his bones. So he was preserved. He was taken to the tomb. But I'm not there. As we continue in verse 7 in the book of Exodus, you find that it says, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lentils of the houses where they eat. They eat it. Now, remember, here, that's when they sacrificed the lamb. And a prescription on how the lamb was supposed to be uh, sacrificed was already given. And when the lamb was supposed to be sacrificed, was already told that it was supposed to be sacrificed at twilight. And I, like I indicated, as you saw, Jesus Christ died on twilight as well. And this was a perfect prophecy about Jesus the Messiah. So I am not here to convince you, but to tell you that Jesus Christ, who was crucified on Calvary, who was killed, under the Roman uh, Roman Romans, uh, leadership and governorship of the Israelites, this Jesus was Lord, and this was the lamp of God, this lamp of God that was supposed to take the sin of man away, and indeed he died for the purpose of cleansing us, and his blood, he bled on Calvary, for his blood was supposed to cleanse us, to cover us, so that when God looks at us, mankind, he will see the blood of the lamb without blemish, the lamb without sin. And as he sees this blood, we, he will see us like he sees his son. He will see us as his children. And Jesus was converting us as God's people to becoming God's children. His blood was significant. And as we continue in the book of Exodus, the Bible says, as I repeat verse 7, it says, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lentil of the houses where they ate it, where they eat the lamb. And as you read verse 8, it says, Then they shall eat the flesh on, the, on that night, roasted in the fire, with the unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw. So that, those are the regulations on how they were supposed to eat the lamb that they sacrificed back in, 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 in Egypt. So now, the blood of Jesus was supposed to be taken and be used for a certain purpose. And that purpose was that the blood must, was supposed to be on their doorpost. Every Israelite, every family of the Hebrews in, in Israel at that time was supposed to take this blood and put it on the lentils and on the doorpost. And the reason for that is because the angel of death was coming. And as the angel of death was coming, this angel, when it sees the blood in the doorpost and in the lentils of their doors, it will not consume them. They were not going to be killed. They were going to leave. And the children of Israel, when this angel came, they were preserved. And indeed, the blood of Jesus was spoken of at that time. It was pointing, pointing to the blood that flew on Calvary. That if this blood comes to you, if you take this blood upon you, if you believe that Jesus Christ died indeed on Calvary, and if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, this blood becomes significant for you and for your life and for your family because you're going to be part of your household. And as you are part of your household, you preach Christ. They will see a new being. They will see a person who has changed, a person who is full of power, a person who is full of grace, a person who is full of compassion and love, and you will wrap this anointing that has, ar has arrived in your life to your family members, and they will take up Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and thus, 
they shall be preserved and they will live. As we go on, the main purpose of this sermon is that you must believe in God. As you believe in God, you must know one thing, that every man in the world claim to believe in God. But today I'm going to help many who are actually listening, who say, we believe in God. I also believe in God. And many more people believe in God. But what differs is, how is your belief? You must also believe in the Son of God. Let's quickly go to the book of John, chapter 14. Today we're dwelling a lot on the book of John. Because John points us to the cross. Hallelujah. And as we continue, uh, the book of John, chapter 14. I'm going to read there from verse 1. And the Bible says to you, Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That is Jesus speaking. Everyone who believes in God must believe in Jesus. It's imperative. If you don't believe in God, then you, 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 you automatically you would not know Jesus. But if you believe in God and you have not been introduced to Jesus, today is your day. Today I want to introduce you to this living Savior. The Lamb that takes away the sin of man. The Lamb that really gives us His blood. And with His blood, we are counted as His children. So Jesus Christ says, believe in me. Why should you believe in Jesus Christ? The Bible says, as it continues, I am in verse 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the reason why you should believe in Jesus. Because no one goes to the Father except through him. No one goes to God except through him. In all creation, in all creation, no one will go to the Father except through him. Jesus refers to God as his father. And he refers to God as his father because he's got this special relationship with him. And as you read right in the beginning of the book of John, let me deviate a little bit. As you go right in verse 1, you will, you will you recognize something very important that is found in the book of Genesis in chapter 1 verse 1 as well. So, the Bible says here, Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Nothing was made that was made. This is Jesus. The Bible says, in the beginning was there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the same Word was, was God. Now you come back, to this scripture where he says I am the way, I am the truth I am the life and no one comes to the father except through me. So you now you understand that in actual fact the word that was used back in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 right in the beginning to create everything that we see and we perceive and we enjoy. It says here in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse uh, 1. It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, this is the voice he used. And when you read uh, chapter 1, the Bible teaches us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, the very same Word was God. And in the beginning, God used the voice to create. And the voice he used, he was speaking the way, and he was speaking Christ. And these are the ways that I'm giving you to have this light. To know that Jesus Christ is the only way, is the truth, is the life. And no one will go to the Father except through him. Now, you must understand who this Father is. If you don't understand who the Father is, today you have understanding. This Father, people are looking for Him. They want to get knowledge. 
They want to understand how this world came about. How was it created? The scientists say it came with a big bang. And this big bang was caused by the word of God. It was caused by God himself speaking. And this is Jesus' power that created the whole world. I'm introducing you to the Father. And he says, my Father, as he says in, in, back in the, in the book of uh, John, he says, no one comes to me except through, no one comes to the Father except through me. And this Father that he's talking about is the omniscient God, the all-knowing God. God who knows everything. God who's about the scientists. God who gives you wisdom to be able to find cures for all kinds of diseases. So if the world wants wisdom, it rests in Jesus. And this Jesus Christ, you need him for wisdom. Everything that we see, that we perceive in this world, God gave you wisdom to create. And don't be fooled. Today, we are quarantined. And it's not only South Africa that is quarantined. Is the USA, the number one country in the world, is Italy. It's the, the country that first colonized the world. It's, 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 it's China. All these big powers are also colonized. And even the poorest country, no one is spared. And no one realizes, everyone realizes today that we are powerless. We are not all knowing. We are not omniscient. So I'm telling you now, the Father that Jesus Christ was talking about is the omniscient God. Is the Father of all wisdom. Is the Father of all knowledge. And He's your Father too. And you can be, He can become your Father today if you take Christ, His only begotten Son, whom He gave to the world, that anyone that believes in Him must believe and must have eternal life. And so that you cannot die. And I'm not talking about the death in the flesh. I'm talking about the eternal life that we must all attain. Because a man is a spirit. He lives in the body. And he lives forever. In this world, you need this body to exist. But in the world to come, you don't need this body. That is why in his coming, the Bible teaches us that when he appears, we will be changed and we will be like him. In the instant of an eye, we will be like him. And I tell you now today that Jesus is coming. And his coming and his coming is the truth. You can see how powerless the world has become. You are now in your houses. You are powerless. We are powerless. I'm powerless. We need God. We need God now more than ever. If we submit ourselves to him, he will give us wisdom. Like he gave you, gave you wisdom to build your houses. Like he gave you wisdom to build this Facebook, this YouTube. Like he gave you wisdom to build the motor cars that you're driving, the aeroplanes you're driving. But you will now realize that these aeroplanes can be grounded. They cannot fly forever. Everything that God created is subject to the law of gravity. Because God says you can be grounded. He grounds you for you to live. But the bigger life is in Jesus Christ. You must know that there's life beyond the flesh. Don't succumb to the life of limitation in the flesh. Because you have the omniscient God, whom you can make your father today. So who is this father that Jesus Christ is talking about? Is the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God. This God is powerful. And Jesus can come anytime. And as he come, I'm talking to you, his children. Are you ready? Are you ready? I know the world is not prepared. I know the world is not ready. But God has opened new avenues for us to preach to the people who are lingering on social media, who are lingering on YouTube, on cyberspace. Today, God is reaching out to you in multitude. The word is full. Please grab this word for your life. I'm telling you, this Father is an omnipotent God. He's an all-powerful God. He's powerful. He can change everything. And he can restore normality. 
He can. But he wants you to believe in him. Jesus Christ says, do you believe in God? Also believe in me. That's what he says. You've got to believe in him. Because if you don't believe in him, how are you going to get to heaven? How are you going to attain your eternal life? You know your, your days in this flesh are limited. It doesn't matter what you accumulate in this world. How much wealth you may have. You will leave this wealth, wealth in this world. Because all at the end of the day is vanities of vanity. It's foolishness. You may need this world for the time being. For the hundred years you're going to live. For the eight years you are living. For the ninety years you are living. But beyond the flesh, your spirit doesn't die. A spirit man doesn't die. Gain wisdom and pursue God. Believe in Jesus. This father that Jesus Christ is talking about is an omnipresent God. He's everywhere. You are banished into your houses. God is right there in your living room. He's there. Bow down and worship him. Bow down and pray. Bow down and call him into your life. Bow down with your family. Change your mindset. Change your thinking. And know that this God is an omnipotent God. He's an all-powerful God. And he loves you so much. This God is Adonai. He's the master. He's Yahweh. He's self-existent. This is the God we call Supreme God. El. He's El. In Israel, in Hebrew, they call him El. The Supreme God. He is supreme. He is above the powers of this world. He is above everything. This God is supreme. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. He is omnipotent. He is supreme above all powers. I am talking to you about the creator of the heavens and the earth. The father of Jesus Christ. Your Lord and your savior. Won't you believe in him? He's begging you to say, you believe in God? Believe also in Jesus. This Jesus is not just an ordinary prophet. This Jesus is the Messiah. This Jesus is God himself. Yes, he is. Maybe your heart is shaking. You say, but how can he be God? He is God and we are not blasphemy. This is God himself. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the very word was God. Jesus Christ is God. To the glory of God the Father. He is God. So this God is the most high God. This Father of Jesus Christ is the most high God. He is the most high. His name is El Elyon. The El Elyon, the most high God. He is the most high. There is no any other God that comes close to him. Any other God are the works of man. But this El Elyon is the most high. He's the supreme God. He's El. Won't you submit yourself to him? Because you've realized that you are powerless. You've realized that you have no hope without him. You are waiting for the next order from the government. You are waiting for the next order from the Department of Health. Won't you wait, wait for the next order from the heavens? Because this God is the omniscient God. Is the all-knowing God. The El Elohim. El Elohim means the living God. Our God is not dead. This God is not dead. He's alive. Today you must receive this life in your earthen vessel. And I'm telling you, if you receive this God, the El Elohim, you receive the living God, the God who never dies, Jehovah, Yahweh, the self-existing one, he is never created. You will live. You and your family will live. Yahweh. The self-existing one. He has not been created. El Elohim. The living God. This is the living God. This is the living God we are prophesying about. We are preaching about. El Elam. The El Elam means the everlasting God. It is from eternal to eternity. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Won't you love this God? 
He stretched out the mountains and the seas. He called seasons at their own time. You, you find rain in its own time. You find winter in its own time. There is no confusion. Spring is coming in its own time. All seasons listen to him. All creation listen to him. They are all in perfect order. And we see it, we enjoy the order that God has created. But we forget that there is a creator of the order of the world. And that creator of the order of the world is calling unto you. I say, you believe in God. You believe in me. Believe also in my son. Believe also in Jesus. Believe on in him. And Jesus says, there is no one who comes to my father except through me. This lamp of God that was slain for our sins says, look, I was crucified for you. Maybe you didn't know it was the plan right from the beginning that I must be slain. He was slain before the foundation of the earth because God had a plan. Because God is an omniscient God, he knew that man will deviate. And he had a plan with the lamp, Jesus Christ, the lamp of God, that was slain for our sins. And as he was slain for our sins, he keeps on introducing us to his father. He says, you must know this father. You must know God. This God is Elohim. Means he is my God. Now today, you can personalize him. You can call him your God. I'm introducing him to you. You can say, he is not only the father of Jesus Christ. He is also my father. He is my God. Now, Peter, there's, there's a man in the Bible who, when Jesus Christ resurrected, and the disciples saw him, and he appeared to them, this man missed his chance of seeing the Messiah. He's one of the disciples. And as he missed his chance to see the Messiah, and he came back, the Messiah had left. And they told him, our master was here. And he was so shocked, he didn't believe. And as he was shocked, he said, I will not believe until I see his wounds. I will not believe until I put my, my fingers on his hands and on his side. So that I can believe that this, this is my master. As he was speaking, Jesus Christ came and he appeared. He says, Thomas, Thomas, put your hand in my wounds. Put your hand on my side. And he said, my Lord and my God. Now today, I want you to be in that position where you can also say, Elohim, my Lord and my God. And personalize this God. And say, this is my master. Now, Thomas is also telling us that Jesus is not an ordinary prophet. He is God. He says, my Lord and my God. He's, he talks like not any other disciples as, as prophesied. And he says, my God and my Lord. Now, you understand the magnitude of how big your God is. Your God is big beyond your imagination, beyond your mind, beyond your comprehension. He's big. You cannot contain him. You cannot contain him in theories and formulas, in the laboratories. You cannot contain him in the research houses. You cannot contain him in any scientific places. He's bigger than you think. He's big. He's not ordinary. Is the God who created your dream, Earth. I know you are exploring other planets to see if there is no life there. But God in his perfect wisdom gave you Earth to live in it. And you shall live in it. And Earth has got all the ingredients for your life to be sustained in the flesh. And you cannot live in any other planet. Now, as he continues to introduce him to his father, he says, this father is El Shaddai, the almighty God. 
the almighty God, God almighty, El Shaddai. Now you understand that we are in a battlefield. Now you see the battle we are facing. God is almighty. He's all powerful. God is all, he's got all the power to destroy and to victor for you. In this war situation, you've got to battle with the knowledge you have for God. And God wants you to know him. God Almighty, the Most High God, the Master, Jehovah, your righteousness, everlasting God, your provider, all sufficient one, the source of peace. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Now lastly, as Jesus introduced you to your father, he says, this father is Tzibaut. He is Tzibaut. What does it mean? He's the jealous one. Is the jealous one. God doesn't want to share you with idols. He's jealous. And you know why? He qualifies to be jealous. He's jealous for you. And the reason he's jealous for you is because you are the works of his hands. You belong to him. He created you. You cannot give yourself to any other God. He's jealous. The reason you are jealous, the reason a man comes to have jealous He's jealous because he owns something. The, me, the reason you begin to be jealous, let's take girlfriends and boyfriends out there. If a man is possessive and jealous, it's because he thinks he owns a girl. And it is not so. But God has a right to be jealous because all you see is the works of his hands. You are the work of his hands. He is Jehovah Tzibahot. The Lord who's jealous. And his jealousy is healthy. He wants to own his own thing. Is it wrong? Is this, you are his own thing. You are the apple of God's eye. You are made out of his likeness and his image. He crafted you in his knowledge and in his wisdom. You are perfectly done and made. God made you just perfectly like him. You are perfect in his eyes. God loves you and God wants you to come back to him. You are God in, on earth. He has given you authority to call things that are, that, are, that are not as though they are. He can give you power to find cure for any disease, for this AIDS, for Ebola, for COVID-19. Because I don't want to exalt uh, sicknesses. I exalt Jesus, the Lord and Savior. Who has power to deliver us? He is the power of deliverance. So you see, when Jesus Christ was delivering the children of Israel, when he delivered them, when they were between the Red Sea and, and, and their enemies, when they thought they died, Moses in his wisdom called upon God. So at this time, when you have no solution, you are between your enemies, between death and sickness. You've got to be like a Moses. Call upon God. Call upon God. Because your hope is in God. It's in no one else, but it's in God. May God take glory at the end of the day. When cure of this pestilence is found. Because it will be found. But you've got to humble yourself to him. When Moses... Was, was between the Red Sea and his enemies. He called upon God. And as he called upon God, he said to him, Father, we are dying. What should we do? And as he called to him, God said, you just said to the children of Israel, they must stand still. Tell them to move forward. Now I declare, the same way that God had declared to Moses. Or move forward. Keep on working. Keep on uh, experimenting. Putting all together those research. And to find a cure. But when you do that. Don't do it in your own wisdom. Submit your knowledge and wisdom to God. Because God. As you acknowledge it. 
he will give you his his cure he can give you the wisdom to find the solution because our solution comes from nowhere else but from him he's El Shaddai he's Jehovah Shaddai Shaddai is Elohim is our God is an omniscient God omnipotent omnipresent He's there. He hears us. He wants us to come to this perfect relationship with him. As you saw in this Passover, that the actual Passover was about Jesus. That the book of Exodus was pointing us to Jesus. That John told us this is the Lamb of God. That was supposed to take the sin of, of man away, of the world away. So now God wants to take your sin away. Maybe when I talk about sin, you reflect in your own person, personal life. You see your mistakes. Every one of them. Every one of your mistakes. Whatever you have done, it doesn't matter. You sin. And that sin, God can forgive. You can describe it the way you know it. What you have done, God can forgive you. He's calling you unto himself to say, come. Let's talk about it. I'll cleanse you. And you'll be as white as snow. You can be holy. Maybe your community has written you off. But God calls to you. There's no exception. God wants you. God loves you. He says he sent his son in the world. Not to condemn or judge the world. But that the world through him must be saved. Salvation, it's only in the name of Jesus. Now, how do you say, get saved? Maybe you're saying, Murti Manyama, you're talking about salvation. You've told us about God. That is an all-knowing God. Is an all-powerful God. Is an omniscient God. Is Elohim. Is God Almighty. How, how do I begin my relationship with you? Now, I will answer that question. That question can be answered in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 10, 9 and 10. And also in the book of Timothy. Because God says, let me quickly go to the book of Timothy. God says, my brother and my sister, God wants all men to the come to the knowledge of the truth. And what is this truth? This truth is there's only one God. And there's one mediator between God and man. And that is the man, Jesus Christ. He's man because he came in the flesh. He changed and he became glorious. God wants every one of us. It doesn't matter if you're the president. It doesn't matter if you're the minister. It doesn't matter if you're the Sangoma. You are, it doesn't matter if you're a rabbi. It doesn't matter the position you may be occupying. It doesn't matter where you come from, from your religion background. God loves you. God loves traditional leaders. God loves people on different faiths. But he wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. And that truth is, there is only one God. And there is one mediator between man and God. The man Jesus Christ. Amen. So back to Romans 10.10. 10. Now, if you want this mediator into your life, and you want to fulfill God's desire of wanting every man to be saved, to come into the knowledge of the truth, you can say it. You can say this prayer after me. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 9, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and he's seated at the right hand side of the Father. You will be saved. Your life will be transformed. And all your former things will be forgiven. Now you have to begin a new life. If you're going to confess this prayer, I'm going to confess with you right now. Your new life must start. You must turn around. And you must find a church that preaches Jesus Christ. That preaches Jesus Christ. Because people have tendency to bring the distraction on who Jesus is. 
When Jesus Christ is preached in his fullness, that's the church you must find. Pray that God directs you to the church that preach Jesus undiluted word of God. That's what you need. So now, I'm taking you to a new level. You're getting transformed today. You see, you are told that everyone is God's children. But I want to tell you today, not everyone is the child of God. Not everyone is the child of God. You only become the child of God, according to the book of John chapter 1. You only become the child of God when you accept the only begotten one of God, Jesus Christ, in your life as your Lord and Savior. So as it is, you are God's people. All of you, you are God's people. But you've got to meet the transformation. And the transformation is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the only begotten of God. Hallelujah. So if you're excited, you want to pray with me, bow your heads, wherever you are, or raise your head towards your screen or towards your phone, towards whatever you know you are watching through, and say, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that God, the Almighty, Elohim, is your Father. And with my, with my heart, I believe that God raised you from the dead. I believe, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord, that you are seated at the right hand of the Father. And today, my life has changed. I'm embracing God's plan for mankind. I accept you in my life. Thank you for forgiving every sin in my life, for cleansing me right now with the blood that is power, the blood of the Lamb of God. I am cleansed, Jesus, by your blood in the mercy city in heaven. I am cleansed. I'm your child. Today, when this lockdown finish, I'll take up my Bible and I will go and look for a church. We thank God that today you've made that decision, Waneso. This is your transformation time. And God loves you. Thank you very much. Please watch, continue watching this broadcast at Word of Faith Bible Church. And Word of Faith will be delivering the Word, undiluted Word of God, through this podcast. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.